number 20. Revelation chapter number 20. And this is lesson number 77. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to finish this up here in the next few months, I would hope. Uh, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, we're not in a hurry or anything like that. But I know it's been a long study here in the book of Revelation. And, uh, but we've been looking at some things, taking some things. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's helped me a lot. Uh, it's given me a better understanding of the book. And as I've studied to prepare for the lesson. So let's begin tonight taking one more look at Revelation 20, verse number 6. And the Bible says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On, the second, uh, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So in the wording in verse number 6 that I just read, notice those words uh, toward the end, um, uh, actually toward the beginning of the verse where it says, He that hath part. He that hath part. There's three groups mentioned here that have a part in the first resurrection. Of course, uh, the first group would be the church. Uh, they'll have a part in that first resurrection. The martyrs under the fifth seal up into the beast, uh, Revelation chapter number six. And then the third group will be the martyrs killed by the beast until the second coming. Each of these groups have a part in the first resurrection. And so uh, the next thing we see there in, in Revelation 26, and just in way of review here, is, uh, is a reference that says, shall reign with him a thousand years. Uh, this is a literal thousand year period. I say it again. Uh, Want to make sure you, you all get this. I know you do, but there's a lot of folks who just can't seem to grasp this concept. But it says there that uh, shall reign with him a thousand years. And I believe what the Bible says, a thousand years is a thousand years. And um, it's a literal, not a spiritual. This is not a spiritual figment of man's imagination. This is a, a literal understanding of God's word. And it says it very clearly, 1,000 years. Uh, so because it is literal, uh, a 1,000-year period, we must ask the question, what is the purpose of this 1,000-year kingdom of Christ? Why did he so choose to do this? Well, first of all, Let's look at it from God's perspective. Uh, first of all, from God's perspective, it is, it is uh, uh, first, it's a public honoring of his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will sit on the throne, he will rule and reign, and he will be the supreme authority over the whole earth. Uh, so it's a, it's a public honoring of him. God's uh, honoring his son, fulfilling the promises that he made. Uh, number two, it's a fulfillment of all of God's promises, uh, many of which we've already talked about throughout the book. Uh, number three, it is the final trial of sinful men. Uh, during the uh, millennium, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, there will be people born into the millennial kingdom. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Number four, it will usher in the conditions that, are pre that were present in the garden. Uh, God will be supreme as far as uh, watching over and everything will be just as it should be. And so man will have no excuse uh, not to do the things that they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, we've said this before that the Garden of Eden was a perfect place for mankind. It was a perfect environment. It was a perfect, uh, everything that man needed was there. But yet man still sinned. And so... Uh, we'll see that in a, in a couple of moments as all, well as in, in the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, so that's from God's perspective, a couple of things. And look, look at a couple of things from Christ's perspective. It is the kingdom for which he waited. Uh, when he first came to earth as a child and grew up as a man and had his ministry, uh, everyone thought that he was going to be the king then. But uh, it was a kingdom, the, the millennial kingdom is one that he waited for. He didn't have it in his first go around, but he will have it when he comes uh, again. And that's according to Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 12 through 13, if you want to look at the notes or look at the scriptures on that. It is the establishment of righteousness. Christ ruling and reigning, everything will be as it should be. Uh, there'll be no crooked judges, no liberal judges, no woke judges. Uh, it will be everything done in perfect righteousness. Uh, it, is, it is his will being done on earth. 
uh, which we see that as a fulfillment of, of, of the scriptures. It, it is his reward, it is his reward for the meek. Remember in the, in the uh, Beatitudes, we saw the promises of Christ there to the meek. Uh, it is his honeymoon with his bride, the church. Uh, the church will be there. It will be uh, a serving, ruling and reigning with Christ as a reward for, their, uh, for, as a reward for our faithfulness. Uh, then thirdly, we see it from the church's perspective. The trouble is over for the church. Amen. No more uh, fighting and fussing over churches. No more fighting over man's religions. Uh, none of that will happen. It, the, the time for trouble for the church is over with. Uh, and so uh, it'll be a manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, it, it will be the second phase of rewards given. It'll be obedient Christians ruling and reigning with Christ, uh, everything as it should be. And then fourth, we see the perspective of the world, a, a rod of iron for the unregenerate. There will be unregenerate people there in the kingdom. And so uh, not all will willingly serve God, uh, just like today. People don't serve God. They don't want to serve God. They want nothing to do with God. And because there'll be unregenerate people born in the kingdom, there's going to be the same thing. There's going to be some who will have to serve, or not serve, but have to obey, I should say, but they won't do it willingly. That's why there's a rod of iron. Christ will rule with a rod of iron. There'll be no excuses given. Uh, and so, uh, you know, today we live in a time of excuses. You know, everything is an excuse. Why I can't do this, why I can't do that. Here's why I did this. Uh, that won't fly in the reign of Christ the millennium. Uh, there's a, finally a worldwide peace. There won't be any wars going on. Uh, nations will be at peace with, e uh, with each other because the Lord will not allow anything but that. Uh, it'll be yearly worship of the King Jesus sitting on the throne there in Jerusalem. And then lastly, we see it from Israel's perspective. Everybody has a part to play here, but... All of, all of Israel's enemies will be gone. Uh, Israel will not be on the, the receiving end of, of persecution like they have been throughout the church age. Uh, all kingdom promises are finally realized for Israel during the, uh, during the millennial kingdom. All of those promises that God made to his people will be fulfilled and will come true. Uh, there's many who believe that those promises are no longer in effect. Well... We, we don't serve a God who makes promises and doesn't keep his word. Uh, he always keeps his word. And so, and then lastly, we see it from creation's side. Creation is no longer subject to vanity. Uh, we are living in a time where creation is subject to vanity uh, more than we can even imagine at times. Uh, but that won't be the case then. Uh, all killing ends in the millennial kingdom. There'll be no killing. Animals uh, will not kill one another. Uh, like we see today. Uh, men no longer violent against other men, uh, murdering and killing and all those things. Those things will be nowhere to be found in the millennial kingdom. And then there's a, there is a regeneration. And according to Acts chapter 3, verse 19, let me just read that verse for you real quick, Acts 3, 19. And uh, here the Bible says that, um, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing, that's the millennial kingdom, shall come from the presence of the Lord. And so uh, the, 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 uh, many of the unregenerate folks um, uh, will, will have an opportunity to be in the kingdom as well, and uh, they will be able to experience the, the uh, peace, the calm, the the, the, you know, all the way that things are throughout the millennial kingdom, they'll, they'll be a benefit of, benefit of them as well. So, so with that, let's look at Revelation 20, verse number 7, which is our material for tonight. Uh, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And when the 1,000 years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. You see that? Verse number 7, uh, shall be loosed out of his prison. Now, Last week, I told you that uh, Satan was bound with the chains and he was arrested because he was the most, uh, the most evil uh, villain throughout, throughout the history of our world that's ever been. And uh, he was public enemy number one and he was arrested and chained and thrown into the pit 
for 1,000 years. But it's not permanent. Revelation 20 verse 7 tells us that when the thousand year period is over, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And we told you uh, last week that at the beginning of chapter 20, uh, we see the arrest and chaining placed in the pit, kept there for the duration. But according to this verse, Revelation 20 verse 7, there will come a time uh, that he is going to be let loose, and the Bible says, for a little season. It doesn't say that in verse uh, 7, but it does say it in verse number 1. Revelation 20 verse 1 gives us the fact that uh, he'll be loosed for a little season. So during the millennial kingdom, thousand year reign of Christ, he will face opposition, or I should say, uh, uh, let me make sure I got my note right here. Uh, uh, verse 3. Verse 3, okay. Verse 3. Um, yes, thank you. Verse number 3. And so um, many men will obey, like I said a few minutes ago, uh, they will obey Christ because Christ will rule and reign with a rod of iron, and he will rule in that day. He will be the, 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 the decider of all things. Uh, there will be no man-made courts like we have today, uh, no man-made governments. Christ will be the all in all for during that period of time. And so uh, when you see, though, that he is, he's chained here in the pit for uh, 1,000 years during that time, um, uh, he will be there uh, throughout the millennia. He won't have any effect uh, on, on society like he does now, but then he will be loosed. And so uh, look at Psalm 66 with me for a second. Psalm 66, and then also find Isaiah 26. Psalm 66, and, and then Isaiah 26. And we'll see... Uh, in Psalm 66, we'll see that uh, God will rule or the Lord will rule uh, by his power. Uh, notice verse number 7. Psalm 66, verse number 7. Verse 7 says, He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. So uh, that verse kind of tells us that even though he's ruling with a rod of iron, there's going to be still some that just don't want to do uh, what they're supposed to do. Uh, they'll do it because they'll have to do it, but they won't do it because they want to do it. And, uh, you know, sometimes even now in our church time, our church age that we're living, uh, I think there's a lot of Christians, uh, and I can put myself in that camp from time to time, when we read the Word of God and we see what God wor God's Word says to us about what we're supposed to do, there's times, let's face it, that we all get a little rebellious. We don't want to do certain things. Amen? And uh, so during the millennium, it'll be that way to some extent as well. The difference will be, uh, we won't be optional. Right now, as a, as a child of God living in the church age, uh, we have the liberty to do what God says to do. We don't have to do it. It's best if we do it, but we don't have to. Uh, Christ doesn't beat us over the head every time we don't do something that we're supposed to do. And so, uh, but in the millennium, it'll be mandatory. It'll be mandatory obedience to the, to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, there won't be the option of doing what we're supposed to do. He will not stand for anything less. Why? Because the kingdom will be noted for righteousness and righteousness, according to the Bible, is doing things the way God wants them to do. Right living according to God's directive. See, right now, when we talk about righteousness, people have different mindsets about that. And they think that righteousness is whatever they think is best. As long as they don't hurt somebody and as long as they're nice. and those kind of, But righteousness, according to, to, to the word of God and what will be present in the millennial kingdom, will be righteousness according to what God says to do. Okay, and so look at Isaiah 26, look at verse number 9. Isaiah 26, verse 9. The Bible says here, With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, here it is, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. 
You see that? Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness? There's going to be people who just don't want to learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will be uh, will he deal unjustly, that's the, the rebellious people, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when, the, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. So it's not a situation here in the millennial kingdom where Men can just do as they please, and as long, it, even if when they're, you know, in other words, if they're doing things that are hurting to people, they're not going to get away with it. See, right now we live in a time where men can do pretty much whatever they want to do, and oftentimes they get away with it. But that's not going to be the way it is when Christ is sitting on his throne. He'll not stand for that. The blessings of the earth during the Messiah's reign. The fulfillment of prophecies to Abraham and to David. The removal of the curse of creation. That's why the animals won't be eating each other anymore. The new covenant with Israel and Judah will, be all, will all be experienced in the 1,000 year reign of Christ, the millennium. And when the 1,000 years are expired, Satan shall be loosed. So why is he loosed? So that man might learn. Peace and security cannot save a person. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were in a perfect place. God provided all their needs. But they still disobeyed God. So putting somebody in a perfect environment doesn't necessarily make them do what they're supposed to do. A righteous environment cannot save a person. Proper government cannot save a person. Man is not naturally good. Man does not naturally seek God. You hear these people say, well, I was seeking God. No, God set the circumstances in your life where he found you. If you're hearing your child of God tonight, that's how it happened. It didn't happen because you went on a, a spiritual uh, awakening tour or something like that uh, sight does not guarantee faith hell does not change someone into being righteous second corinthians 5 17 tells us therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If any man be in Christ, the Bible says he's a new creature, which means that if a man is not in Christ, he is never changed. If he's not in Christ, he's not been changed. Uh, whether he lives 10 centuries in the Messianic kingdom, the thousand year reign, or, 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 or in the fires of torment, unless he's in Christ, he's not changed. There's no possibility of man reforming themselves apart from Christ. The only thing that changes a man is for them to be born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have all kinds of people out there in our society today. Matter of fact, I got an email this week from uh, some organization that promotes, uh, uh, you know, uh, young people, ministry for young people, uh, teenagers. Uh, it's a it's called it's a school of some type, and uh, they they set up programs uh, for teenagers. And the the thrust of the email to me was, do I have any teenagers that I'd want to send there? And I as I read the description of what they're going to do, I said, not on your life. Okay, because they're they're going to teach them all of the world's philosophy about uh, being a good person. But we just told you that man is not inherently good. Uh, man is born a sinner. And until that is dealt with through the blood of Christ, he will continue uh, to be uh, sinful in his behavior. Uh, there's no possibility of a man reforming themselves apart from Christ. How do we know this? Well, the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 gives us a proof text of this. Uh, you know the story. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus were 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 uh, they both died and 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 they were there and 
and uh, Lazarus was in paradise, and the rich man was in torments. And um, if you read the whole story, uh, the rich man never uh, showed any remorse or repentance for his actions when he lived. There's nothing there that says that. Uh, he didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't tell God that he was sorry. Uh, we see none of those things present in that story. And yet here he is in torments. And uh, you'd think that somebody that was in torments, if they had an opportunity uh, to speak, would, would want to be saying, well, you know, I'll do better next time, or I'll, you know, I won't do it again, or I'm sorry for what I did. But that's not there. Uh, no request to be forgiven. When the pit is open, though, in Revelation chapter 9, another proof text, the creatures come forth out of the pit with only destruction on their minds. That was several lessons ago, but if you go back and refresh yourself for Revelation 9, you'll see that. What's the point? Uh, man cannot reform himself from his wicked state but Christ. Psalm 10 and verse 4, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. What's that mean? The wicked man truly doesn't even think about God. He's not seeking him, and he won't even think about him most of the time. Uh, the, the God of the Bible is, is on no one's mind in society to any great extent. If it was, we'd see more people at the church house. But it's not. And so we don't see folks. Uh, in hell, uh, there's no more hearing of the word of God to bring the faith that we need in order to be born again. That's why when you get to hell, there's no hope. No hope for a second chance. No hope for, uh, for another opportunity to be born again. Uh, when you're there, you're done. It's over. It's complete. Uh, you're going to be as you are in torments for all eternity. Psalm 49 verses 7 and 9 says, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, we have a verse that tells us that, precious in the sight of the Lord of the deaths of his saints. And so uh, the soul is precious to God, and, it's, and, and, and uh, the soul lives forever and ever. A man's soul never dies. Never dies. Lives either for eternity with Christ, if you're born again, or it lives in eternity in torments at the final end. Every soul of man is everlasting. When it leaves the body at death, it is still the same soul. Upon death, the soul moves from the temporal to the eternal. People say, well, you know, when Johnny hits rock bottom, he'll get things right. How many times have you heard that? It's got to hit rock bottom. But let me say this. Circumstances will change no person eternally. So if a person's life and the circumstances of their life has caused them to hit rock bottom, that's not going to change them eternally. And in truth, many cases, when a person hits rock bottom, many times they take their life. They say enough is enough, and they, they think they're going to escape by killing themselves. Well, all that they've done is they've just sealed their fate to be an eternal torment. I said earlier that there will be unconverted sinners that will survive the tribulation period. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19 says this, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Remember, worshiping of Christ in the millennium will be mandatory. The Lord of hosts, and to keep the feasts of tabernacles, and it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, 
Even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt do not go up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to feast, keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. So what is he talking about? I said to you that during the millennium, obedience to Christ is mandatory. And those who do not obey, uh, he will rule with a rod of iron. Now, when you hear that thought, you think for a second that he's going to be carrying a long rod of steel, and when they don't obey, he's going to bash them over the head. But let's just say this. God has a way of making the disobedient obedient. Amen? Uh, so uh, some will escape the Antichrist. Some will refuse the mark. Uh, somehow they will escape death, but most will not. Uh, there will be some from the sheep nations that helped God's chosen people during the tribulation, and they were granted access as a reward. Uh, they did not receive Christ, so they're un still unconverted, but they'll be the rewarding of letting them come into the millennial kingdom. They'll come alive into the kingdom. Children born during the millennial kingdom will be born with an Adamic nature, which means they'll have a sin nature, uh, there's no Bible reason to believe that uh, they will be much different than children today who grow up rebelling against their parents, rebelling against authority, re, uh, rejecting the things of God, just like kids today do. Uh, so, but again, it won't, it won't go unpunished. See, right now... Uh, you can take any 12-year-old, just use the age of 12, and he doesn't have to do it. He, has, he has to, doesn't have to do anything spiritual if he doesn't choose to do it. His parents don't make him. He decides he doesn't want to. And the truth is, right now, there's no immediate consequence. That person at age 12 can grow up reach the age of 25, still rejecting, still rebellious towards the things of God, and there's seemingly no consequence immediate. That same 12-year-old can grow up to age 25, and then at some point, somebody like one of us can bring them the information that they need about repentance and Christ and the Bible and all the things that we know, give it to them, and they can choose to be born again. Right? But they can also continue in their rebellious state. And seemingly no consequence. You and I both know people who've lived their whole life up until the high ages not wanting anything to do with God. But they still live on. And then they die. And then they realize, hey, I made a big mistake. You know, I've often heard people say this. I think it's very good. You know, I can practice my faith and do things that I think God wants me to do according to the Bible. And if I'm wrong about it, what have I lost? Right? But if you're wrong about your position and rejecting God all of your life, boy, it's not going to go well with you when you pass away. Because you're going to find out that you were wrong and you've lost everything. So, so what will Satan do upon his return? Look at verse number 8. So Satan is, is bound at the beginning for the thousand years. Verse 7 tells us he's loosed. Verse 8 tells us what he's going to do. It says, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, these two words, Gog and Magog, have caused much confusion in many people's minds and hearts over the years. Uh, many different commentators have attributed these two names 
Gog and Magog to several European nations or nations of the world. But on closer inspection of the whole council of the word, we find that Gog is a reference to a character. Magog is a reference to a land. So you have a person and then you have a, a place. Gog is the person. Magog is the place. I've heard people say, well, Gog and Magog, these two people. It's not two people. Gog is a person. Magog is a place. Ezekiel 38, chapter 38, verses 1 through 4 says this, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, comma, the land of Magog. So right there, you have proof text that Gog is a person, Magog is a place. The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophecy, I prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, we can speculate all day long about who this person is and where this place is. But what we do know for sure is that there will be a person named Gog and there will be a place called Magog that that person comes from and he will have a close tie to that place. And the Bible tells us that Gog will be the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, I don't know where those places are. And I don't believe the Bible tells us definitively where they are. Uh, but there will be a battle, similar to the Battle of Armageddon, where the world's evil forces will come again against the saints of God. Now, we've been told and we've read ourselves and people have told us that the Battle of Armageddon will settle everything once and for all. But at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, toward the end of the Millennial Kingdom, there will be another battle. And it will come because of all those rebellious people that are born into the millennial kingdom, uh, the unconverted people that are there. And when Satan is loosed for a little season, they're going to be his target group. And that's where in verse number eight, where the Bible says that he will, he will go out and shall deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. So, uh, there will be specific places that these people will be, and he's going out to try to gather them up again and uh, try once and for all to rid the world of God and all of his influences. However, the end will be the same as before. It will not last long, and fire from God will utterly destroy all of these God-haters once and for all. Now, this can only happen if Satan is let loose again. He's let loose again, the Bible says, for a little season. And exactly how long that is, the Bible doesn't really say. But we know that it'll happen. You know, there's many things in the Bible that we can't dogmatically say for sure. We can't dogmatically say a little season means a week, or a little season means a month, or whatever. We, we just can't do that. Uh, it says a little season. So we just have to be confident in knowing that it'll be a little season. And uh, uh, there will be a population explosion during the millennial kingdom in the world. Why? Because there'll be no disease, no murders, no death, no drug abuse, no car accidents, no... Uh, you know, all of the things that take people's lives today, uh, people born in the millennium will just keep on living. So it'll be like a population explosion that's never been before. That is why there's a reference to this great company of God-haters whose numbers will be as the sand of the sea. When you see that phrase, sand of the sea, as the sand of the sea, that's, you know, you can't pick up a handful of sand on the coast and count the granules. It's just they're un, unnumerable. Uh, so uh, the numbers will be as the sand of the sea gathered out of the world's population. And then when we come to verse 9, it says here, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. 
about and the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. And fire came down from heaven, or excuse me, came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I said to you a little while ago that uh, during the millennium, there's going to be uh, conditions like have never, like we've never known. The millennium, uh, the millennium is, is not eternal blessedness. The very fact that the scripture so clearly states that there will be 1,000 years of peace should indicate that such an age will have an end. You know, when God says it'll be 1,000 years, that means that there's a beginning and there's an end. So the kingdom conditions will not be eternal, but they will be there for those thousand years. Uh, many of the dispensational teachers have consistently matched the millennial day with the Sabbath rest, but I don't think that's accurate because it, it answers the, the, the millennium kind of more parallels the sixth day of creation rather than the seventh. Why is that? Because on the sixth day, the man and the woman were placed in the perfect garden, living in peace with all the other creatures, enjoying fellowship with their God. Yet at the end of the day, at the end of that day, the serpent entered, that's the devil. He appealed to the uh, weaknesses of the humans and he spoiled the wonderful setting in the garden by causing them and, and enticing them to sin. So look at this with the millennial view in mind. Throughout the millennial kingdom, Christ is on the throne. Everything is as it should be. He's ruling and reigning in complete righteousness. Everything is good. No disease, no murder, no violence, none of those things. And yet Satan is then loosed for a little season. And he comes and he tries to uh, entice those that are there that are still rebellious in nature. And uh, he accomplishes his mission. And so the thousand-year kingdom is the last period of man's trial. In other words, all those ones that were unconverted in the kingdom will be on their final trial, and they'll either uh, be righteous and do the things that God says to do, or they won't. But it is a trial in the best circumstances that man could find himself in. So think about this. You know, if you take man and you put him in the best of circumstances... You think, well, he's going to be successful. If you place him in the best circumstances imaginable, I mean, what would keep him from not? Well, think about it for a second. When a child is born into the world, the child is, you know, uh, by the world's definition, is innocent, it's, it's precious, it's, uh, you know, all the things that we talk about with a young child, a baby, but then it grows up. And then it begins to understand that it has a free will. It can make whatever choices that it wants to make. Uh, parents do their best to try to teach and keep the child in, you know, on the track that they should be on. Some parents do a very good job of this. Some don't do anything at all. But as the child grows up and reaches the place where they begin to sort of exert their own will, there's a choice to either go with God or not. And the millennium will be no different than it is today. Some will go with God and some won't. The thousand-year kingdom is the last period of man's trial. It's not his final rest. It is a trial in the best circumstances that could be imagined, like those that were in Eden, yet in some ways better. The millennium will settle once and for all the question as to whether or not sin is the mere fruit of ignorance or of bad government or of any of the accidents of life to which it is so constantly uh, Im imputed. People say, well, I wouldn't have done that except. I wouldn't have acted that way if she hadn't acted that way. See, we, we, we live in a place where, where we like to make excuses for our bad behavior. But what brought the condemnation upon man and the, and the devil was a will, the devil's uh, uh, devices. And the devil had a, a willful desire to set himself above God. 
You know the story. I will exalt and all those things that, that Isaiah talks about. I will be as the most high and all that. And the truth of the matter is many people follow that same logic. They want to be their own gods. They want to do whatever they want to do. I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do. So what brought condemnation upon man was that uh, the seventh day of the creation story in Genesis finds its match in the new heavens and the new earth. Not the millennial kingdom. There's no genuine rest until that day, which is beyond all the days. So as we look at Revelation 20, and we look at these verses, there's a lot to take in. Uh, no, notice again in uh, verse number 9, it says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth. What does that tell us? It says on the breadth. It doesn't say in, it says on. That, that indicates that there's a, a specific given place rather than a worldwide matter. So, in other words, there will be a place that will be uh, this, this evil uh, rebellion against the God, uh, against God will be uh, kind of uh, localized to a place. It'll be a specific place. Uh, the term is, that's used in Genesis uh, chapter 13 for Palestine, uh, the, there's, there's two other phrases, the camp of the saints and the beloved city in that verse. Uh, if you see verse number nine, uh, you see uh, there says, uh, compass the, the camp of the saints about. Well, that's obviously going to be a specific place, the camp. And then it says, uh, and the beloved city. So, uh, those are specific locations, and uh, they're going to be the ones that are going to be sort of surrounded, if you will, by these God rebellion or God rebellious people, haters, whatever you want to call them. And so, um, and then when we come to verse 10, notice what we see. There's no description of the battle per se. We know that there will be a battle, but there's no real description of it. But verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So it's almost like God's saying, I'm not going to write about this again because the devil's going to get his. I don't need to give you all the details of how it happens. He's just going to get it. And he says he'll be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet have already been put and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil will finally meet his end. He's chained at the beginning of chapter 20. He's loosed in verse number 8 of chapter 20. But here when we come to verse 10, he will be destroyed. Not destroyed, but he'll be placed in a tormental state for the rest of eternity. Never to escape the lake of fire. You know, I was reading the other day and... Uh, this one preacher was reading, I was reading, he was saying that, think about it, day and night. Notice what it says in, in verse 10. Or, yes, Revelation 20. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire where he, the beast of a, a false prophet are, shall be tormented day and night. What does that mean? There'll be no time of a break. Tormented all day long, all night long, every day, for all eternity. No breaks. And he will never die. The, so his, the, the soul of all that go there will continue to live in torments. So the devil will take his place alongside of his two counterfeit partners, the Antichrist and the false prophet. The devil's counterfeit trinity will be forever gone. Once and for all. And so... When we look at chapter 20, at the end of verse number 10, verse 11 begins with, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens, uh, the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. We're going to stop right there for tonight.
because that's a, a whole other subject. And so I would encourage you to continue to read and reread these verses and see the words. Don't leave out any words. Look at the words closely because they all have a meaning. And uh, we're doing our best to sort them all out and we'll do some review next time as well and make sure that I got these points out to you the way I should have. And uh, like the football people do, I'll watch the tape and see where I messed up. Amen? Let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you once again for another opportunity that we have to come. And Father, we do pray tonight that you'll add your blessing to these things, uh, Lord, as we study, that you'll give us a clear mind and a clear understanding. The Spirit will be our guide. The Word of God will be our authority. And Father, we'll continue to uh, take these things to heart as you give them to us. And Father, we're so thankful that you are our Heavenly Father. Uh, we love you and thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. We ask that you might meet those prayer requests that were mentioned earlier tonight according to your perfect will for each life represented. And Father, we'll thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.